10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Manchester 1, United have zero. reached the promised land. Yes, good morning, everybody. Well, good morning in the UK. Might be good evening, might be good night, might be good afternoon. Wherever you're watching from, how are you doing? Sam here, live on United People's TV. It is Thursday, the 19th of May. And Eric Ten Hag, he's popped off his private jet. Him and Mitchell van der Gag there in England. It's time to really get to work. I'm going to be speaking about everything that's happened in the last 24 hours with Manchester United, as I always do every single morning here in the live show. We're going to speak about Mitchell van der Gag coming to Manchester United, which we already know. We're still waiting for that official confirmation, but he's now flown into England, flown to London more specifically with Eric Ten Hag. I'll run through the article from uh, The Telegraph uh, and Mitchell van der Kran, the Dutch journalist who's bringing all the details on this. I'm then going to run through the latest from The Athletic on Steve McLaren and Mitchell van der Gag. And also Andy Mitten put out a very long article over on the National News. And we're going to run through that because there's a lot of detail and a lot of insight in there from Andy, who is somebody who's very closely connected to the club. Then we're going to speak about transfers, a little bit on Frankie de Jong, a little bit on overall. Neil Wood's going to be leaving our under-23s. Man, it's bit, as I say, I, I, I keep saying it every day, but it is just so busy at Manchester United right now. So much big change. Our, our new manager's just coming in. He's going to be at the game, apparently, against Crystal Palace on Sunday. I've got to try and get a picture with Ten Hag. That's my aim. Jedi, how are you doing there this morning? Paul, I can see what other members you've got down here. Paula, uh, Ashley, good morning to both of you. Joda, Jake, Nick, Takeoff, I can see you there. Ant, Collins, Jack, Sam, Aaron, Peter, Stu. Hey, loads of you down here this morning. And Anuj, I can see you all of there. Apologies if I've missed your names. Jack, look, you've listened to episode four of the podcast. I appreciate that, man. I'm, I'm enjoying the podcast. I think the podcast is the more, when it comes to um, a podcast, it's hard to get that natural conversation flowing online. Much harder than it is to when it's when it's four lads sitting around a table, one microphone. But I think we're doing it quite well. I feel like we're doing it quite well. I'm quite happy. I think the podcast is getting better. I do think episode four is the best one. Um, but yeah, if you haven't already, there's a little follow the QR code there. Scan it on your phone and you can come and follow the United People's podcast. Uh, and yeah, there's something that else is going to be announced tomorrow, by the way. I've been telling you I've been working on the community side of things. Got a big, big announcement tomorrow. And also, um, the 250k giveaway is going to get announced tomorrow. So Friday is going to be a cracking stream. So you definitely want to join in that one. But let's not talk about tomorrow's stream. Let's talk about what's going on today. And Mike Revage from Holland, he's saying that Eric Ten Hag is expected to attend the game against Crystal Palace. And I, I tell you what, man, that's that's good news. I didn't. I, I question whether he would. Uh, in, in the idea that maybe that would undermine. Uh, maybe that would undermine uh, Ralph Rannick a little bit more. But Eric Ten Hag has been, st he's been starting in earnest. He's really got this party started quickly, hasn't he? Eh, party started. Maybe that's the wrong way to describe it. But he's certainly not messing about in how he's working at Manchester United, is he? We we all wanted him to start early. We all thought maybe he'd wait a little bit. But no, nah, he really is getting to work immediately. And I'm, and I'm excited to see what he's going to do. Let me run through the article from The Telegraph with you. Let me see who's down in the comments quick. Um, look at that. Uh, da, 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 and saying big up to the channel, man. Like, thank you. Uh, I can't say enough how amazing it is that the, the, the growth that the channel is going through and the community that's being built behind it. That's why I really want to invest in building this place for this community. I feel like at the moment it's brilliant on all these live streams, but I want to give a place where you can all actually talk outside of these live streams. I think that will help the community build that little bit more. So that's why I'm going to be launching that tomorrow. I'm working on that later today. But don't worry. It's going to be a good one, I think. I think so anyway. But let's head over to the Telegraph and let's read this news. Look at this for a headline. Royal entrance for Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United. That's exciting, man. Royal entrance indeed. Like the little Trump. Like Shrek. I don't know why I've got Shrek in my head. But that, I don't know why. I like Shrek. Shrek's a great film. But look, royal entrance for Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United. Eric Ten Hag has received the royal entrance. The new trainer of the English's top, uh, English top club, very excellent use of words there, was offered a private jet with which he and assistant Mitchell van der Gag were flown from the jet centre at Schiphol East to London. Let's run through all the details about this. That all happened around noon on Wednesday afternoon. 
It was striking that they did not fly to Manchester, but to the English capital. However, those who are familiar with United know, uh, yeah, we've got that big office in Mayfair and that's where he'll be going first and foremost. We scroll down, we get some more information. The management works there for a large part of the week. Ten Hag and Van der Gag therefore operate as a unit from the start. This is important information here, peeps. The head coach is involving his first assistant in everything. And that also makes it clear that former England manager and former assistant to Fergie, Steve McLaren, will take on a less prominent role. Now that again, that's that's something that's really important to understand about this whole situation with Mitchell van der Gag and Steve McLaren. This is likely going to be the main part of the coaching setup for Eric Ten Hag. And there are a lot of people that are saying, hmm, hmm, Steve McLaren, hmm, not sure about that. Make sure you check out the Steve McLaren uh, video that I did. Was it over the weekend? I think it was. Thank you, using the video from the excellent uh, McLaren Performance Podcast. Thank you very much, Josh, for letting me use that. Uh, Steve sort of went into detail about his relationship with Eric Ten Hag, how impressed he's been, gave you a bit more insight into the detail that Eric Ten Hag possesses as a manager and the, the sort of meticulous obsession he has and how we don't have that and we need that, right? But Mitchell van der Gag will properly be his number two. If we were to go through this and read this article a little bit more, we, we continue to get more insight. McLaren is mainly involved in the United project under Ten Hag because of his knowledge of the English football world, the contacts with managers, directors and players. Moreover, Ten Hag thinks it will be wise to have someone on his staff who knows who knows the culture of the club. Now, that's something I've never really thought about, I suppose. The contacts that Steve McLaren might have that Eric Ten Hag simply wouldn't have, that Mitchell van der Gag simply wouldn't have. That was... Okay, uh, fair enough. Because obviously... I know people want to see negatives, I think, when it comes to Steve McLaren. And maybe I'm going the op- too much the, the opposite side and saying, I just want to see all the positives. I'm not going to be blown away by Steve. I'm not going to get Steve McLaren on the back of a United shirt. I'm not going to put a Steve McLaren poster on my wall. But I think I feel like it's probably a smart. I feel like it's a smart appointment, and we want our club to be making smart decisions. That's the way I look at the Steve McLaren situation, and the fact there that it's been reported from the beginning that Mitchell van der Gag would effectively be the number two, whilst McLaren will be there, maybe almost not as an advisor but more of an advisory position than someone like Mitchell van der Gag, who will be the person that Eric Ten Hag, if he's got a problem, he'll turn to Mitchell first. If he's got an issue, he'll ask him for his opinion first and he'll involve him in all the the decisions. Perhaps I wouldn't say, look, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with Steve McLaren, hey? That's, That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there's a lot of United fans that will have a fear that Steve McLaren was just going to be a Mike Thielen, a Mike Thielen part two. And we all know how we all felt about that. Steve, what are you saying down there? McLaren's a good appointment. He has been very critical of the squad, especially Rashford. Uh, I remember after the game against, I think it was City, he was saying that like five or six of these players don't deserve to wear the shirt. Very easy to be saying that when you're not Manchester United's assistant manager. Maybe it will be different when he is assistant manager at Manchester United. Or maybe it won't be. He'll have that same sort of vociferous approach, that no-nonsense approach. And it's very easy for us to as I say, as fans be like hypercritical of players, but it's a bit different when you're facing that player and you're watching him in training every week, you get a little bit more attached. Um, Abon, you're saying who will be the second assistant at that point, at at this moment, there isn't any name. There isn't any name that's been put forward. We have, obviously we've heard Robin Van Persie. We've heard um, Ruvan Nistelrooy, but Steve McLaren was one of those names who mentioned early on alongside René Muhlenstein, actually. So we don't know whether there's going to be anybody else coming in. I still feel there might be. It's going to be Eric Ramsey, I believe, working in terms of the one-on-ones and uh, as a set-piece coach. Well, I'll be honest, we've got really improving set-pieces. And Matt saying, look, have you seen that interview with McLaren? Yeah, we we covered it on the channel over the weekend uh, with permission from Josh from the McLaren Performance Podcast. It's good. Look, Steve McLaren, yeah, Steve McLaren as a coach is very hard, very different to Steve McLaren as a head coach. And I think that's where the difference has to be drawn. Steve McLaren has shown he has very good credentials as a coach. And I think it's a, I think it's a smart decision by Eric Ten Hag. If we're looking at, um, I mean, David Moyes made a ton of mistakes, right? But if we're looking at one of the biggest mistakes that David Moyes did was binning off everybody at Manchester United as soon as he came in. 
Was it Brendan Muenstein at that point? I can't, remember, I can't remember exactly who it was, but Moyes got rid of all the staff at Manchester United and brought all of his staff in as well. And so therefore, he had nobody around him who knew what it was like to work at Manchester United. Everybody else, everybody there was like, oh, Jesus, what is going on here? And that was a big reason why there was nobody. If David Moyes had a question to ask, who's he going to ask? Ed Woodward? He's not going to give you the answer you need. So it is about surrounding yourself with the right people. And Eric Ten Hag has pushed for Steve McLaren. He's absolutely pushed for that to happen. So I think it's the right decision. Let's go down and see what else uh, Marcel van der Klan says in this article. It took weeks before the contract of van der Gag, who could also go to many other clubs at home and abroad as head coach, was completed. And that's something that I've... That's something that I'm quite... Ex I'm not excited about, but it goes to show the ambition of uh, Mitchell van der Gag. He could have gone on to... He could have possibly became Ajax's head coach. I think if he put himself forward for that job, I think he probably would have got it. But he's turned down in the same way that Eric Ten Hag has turned down jobs. He's already said it. He turned down jobs at other clubs that maybe had better structures for success right now. He's turned them down to come to Manchester United because he had, had the ambition. He saw the vision. And Mitchell Van the Gag has turned down opportunities to become head coach elsewhere to work underneath Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United because he's got the ambition and the vision. And that's exciting. It's two people who had choices to go elsewhere but have come to United together. I think that can only be seen as a good thing. Um, thanks to the warm words of many young Ajax players, the former professional, Mitchell van der Gag, is known to have the ability to properly guide and help develop young players. Yes, please. In addition, he is a language prodigy. I don't know what languages he does speak, but I know he speaks Dutch, French, English. I don't know. Well, that's three. It's good in itself. Um, which is a big advantage with the many foreigners in a selection. Ten Hag has made it clear from the start to the management of Manchester United that he wanted van der Gag with him. And he will now be given a prominent role. Where he often sat in the stands at Ajax, he will now sit on the bench next to Eric Ten Hag. That's a good one. And then we go down here and we'll speak about transfers next. But you let me know what you think about that, right? And you're saying, I think someone with the knowledge of the club and the connections is vital. United is almost its own ecosystem, as we are so big. And Fergie was the marvel and the enigma. Yeah, no one. Fergie was, uh, I mean, Wenger was inside that, was, was similar and lasted a bit longer. But you saw how it all unraveled for Wenger. That type of manager does not exist in the modern game. The way that modern football has gone. Effectively, the, the rise of player power and the rise of player agents. That's taken away and ch transformed the whole ecosystem. As Ant says there, the word ecosystem of football clubs. Why is it that people love messaging me when I'm live? Come on, people, I'm live. What are you doing? Uh, Mark saying, I wouldn't mind Yap Stan being brought into the club. I think he'd be a shock to the egos in the dressing room. Absolutely would be. And we all know that. Yap Stan, I don't know what he's done post Reading. Um, but Yapstam, I think, was one of the only people who was actually available as a coach to come in. Maybe he still will. Maybe he still will. We don't know that. Saying, Ian, you're saying, hi, Stan. Steve McLaren is fine as he doesn't, as long as he doesn't try to speak English in a Dutch accent. That, uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen that interview, there's always one bit of sticks out. He's like, uh, how you say underdog? You know exactly how to say underdog. You're English. Just say the word underdog. But he tried to like dumb his English down to be like, hmm. I don't know how to say this word in English, which I know how to say. That really was was uh, was hilarious. FC Cincinnati. There you go. I didn't know that. Um, would Roy Keane... Isn't Roy Keane taking a job somewhere? Where is it? Where's he taking the job? Is it Scotland? I don't know. I, I thought he was leaving. Um, da, 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 what you were saying down here in the comments? A bit late, but good morning to you too, Sigmund. How are we doing? Look. Uh, there's quite a few of you mentioned in the comments, by the way, the interview with Michael Knighton. I'm going to be speaking about that later on. Don't you worry about that. Let me pull this over here and get this ready. I've already got this prepared. As, a, as I say, I prepare everything for the show. I do my research. I make sure that everything's done, make sure that everything's ready to go. So I will be speaking about Michael Knighton. And as I've said on Twitter yesterday, I've already been in contact with Michael Knighton. I spoke to him a couple of months ago to try and get an interview organized. Uh, it just it didn't the timing wise it didn't quite work out but a couple of weeks ago I did a video on Jim Ratcliffe and I said I don't care if he says Manchester United are not for sale I think that's just wrong 
And all of a sudden now everyone's talking about Jim Ratcliffe, Manchester United. I think it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you can just spot things. And maybe I, I, I think, well, I'm actually getting quite good at doing it, actually. Maybe that's maybe that's why the channel's growing. I've got a good hit record recently, which is very unusual for me. But let's go over to that. Actually, no, let's not. Let's not go over there. Actually, no, yeah, let's go over there. We'll go over to the Athletics article and then I'll read. We'll, we'll head back to the, the Telegraph because they speak about transfers, but we're not quite finished on the whole Mitchell van der Gag and Eric Ten Hag situation. This is what The Athletic are saying about this situation here. So Mitchell van der Gag to join the club as Eric Ten Hag's assistant. Uh, Manchester United have completed talks to bring Mitchell van der Gag to the club, says Laurie Whitwell from The Athletic. And they flew to United yesterday. Exactly has been covered there. Ten Hag has been working remotely since leaving Ajax on Sunday, but United's incoming manager wants to make a running start to the job and travel to England to meet colleagues was seen as an important step. Now, Gary Neville spoke about this, didn't he? He wasn't specifically speaking about... Um, he wasn't speaking about staff per se. He was saying, look, this is an opportunity for um, Eric Ten Hag to come in and meet the players, which I think he might do after the season ends. I think that'll be after the game against Crystal Palace. But he's flying to... Eric Ten Hag really is hitting the ground running. He's cancelled that holiday to the Caribbean. To go and celebrate, he could easily have done that. Won the league with Holland. Sorry, won the league with Ajax in Holland. Had that lovely goodbye. No, he said, right, okay, I can't, I can't afford to do that. I don't have time to do that. I mean, realistically, he probably did have time, but could he afford to do it? No, he's gone head first into United's to-do list, which is so exhaustive. But he's given himself the best possible opportunity to nail it, and I'm excited about that. Uh, viable. Nice to see you there rejoining as a member. Nice to have you back on board. Where are you watching from? I'll, I'll try and give you a shout out. Uh, Peter, you're saying once again, Sam, you started with the gym video. Big up. Hey, look, I the, the, I, I see this quite a lot online. Um, there's certain people, I'm not naming names, who love the idea of being first to the story. And if it, if they are first, they'll, they'll, they'll bring up the story and say, hello, I was first to this. I don't, I, for the life of me, I don't give a shit about that. I'm not here. I'm not here to be first to everything. It's just if I see something and I think it's correct, I will do it and I will speak about it. And that's kind of my own philosophy and my approach to what I do, what I report, and what I say. It's not necessarily just about being first. Pratik, love the channel. Love from India. Nice to see you there, my friend. I appreciate that. There's a super chat there from Green saying, "Hello, mate. What's your ideal window ins and outs?" We'll speak about transfers later in the show, Green. Uh, that's coming up. I think I've already done my dream window already, but I, I will talk about that again. And I tell you what. Uh, today's video is definitely, definitely, definitely going to be one that you want to watch. I know I say that every day, but this one's going to be a really good one. I'm going to run through my predictions for what Eric Ten Hag's squad is going to look like for the first game of the season. And I'm going to run through each position and the two to three players that should I think we're going to have in that position. So it's going to be my predictions for how this summer transfer window is going to go. And then we'll be able to look at it come the end of the, end of the summer, the start of the season. I can go back and see how right or wrong I was. I think it'll be interesting to do that. And I'll be really interested to know from you what your opinions on that video will be, because that'll be a good one. Uh, but what else is being said down here? Oh, yeah, I think I've already just ran through that. Steve McLaren will join. We know that. Interim manager Ralph Rannick will, will lead United for the final time on Sunday. And I will be there. And I'm looking forward to it. I'll tell you what, honestly, if I can, if I can somehow manage to bag a picture with Eric Ten Hag, that's what I'm trying to do. That's absolutely what I'm trying to do. Jibak is saying, I'm pretty sure Ten Hag has arrived early to talk to the want away players to discuss his vision and get them to stay if it appeals to them, among other things. I think that will be among other things. I think first and foremost, he'll be meeting John Murto. I mean, he's already met John Murto, isn't he? He'll be meeting the people inside Manchester United's corporate business structure inside the Mayfair office. That will be the beginnings, right? And then I think after the game against Crystal Palace, it won't be before... If Eric Ten Hag was to meet the players before, or maybe he'll just like pop in the dressing room. I don't know, but still that would really undermine Ralph Ragnick. It strikes me that he'll just keep himself in the shadows until that game is finished and then put himself forward. And maybe after the game, he'll go down to the dressing room and say, hello, I'm Eric Ten Hag. Your shit, your shit, your shit. You're gone. You're sold. Get out. He might say that. He probably would say that. But I just don't really think that he would um, do that beforehand. Jake, I'm sure that he'll be meeting Fergie. I'm sure they'll be sitting down, having a glass of red wine, having a conversation. Uh, no doubt whatsoever. Um, uh, we've got Andrew watching from Victoria, Australia. You're on holiday. Man, damn it. Damn. Damn you. Enjoy it, but damn you. 
I want to be on holiday in Australia. Jeez, that'd be nice. Um, let's go and see what else is on my to-do list. Because, of course, we saw this early this week, didn't we? This was reported yesterday here. Uh, did I bring, yeah, I think I brought this to you yesterday. I ran through this article saying Manchester United recruitment team are expected to meet later this week. Now, all of a sudden, Eric Ten Hag, he's in England. So Eric Ten Hag is in England. Manchester United's recruitment team are meeting this week. Hell yeah. Oh, man. It, look, I, I know that I think some of you in the comments, some of you watching, I think you can fairly say, you go, Sam, man, you're really hyping Eric Ten Hag up, aren't you? You're really setting yourself up for a fall. And I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, I'm setting myself up for a fall. But just to me, it feels different. It just feels a bit different this time. You can talk about everything that happened under Woodward and that happened under Mourinho and happened under Van Howe and happened under Solskjaer and happened under Moyers. But this time feels a bit different. It's more of a collective approach from the club, from a business perspective, and a football perspective, it seems like things are starting to actually fall into place. And that's the that's the core and the fundamental reason why I'm excited about what is going on at the moment. And look, I know you can tell me, go, Sam, man, like, seriously, don't hype it up. Don't get excited about Eric Ten Hag. We're going to do it anyway. 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 Ah, there he is. And you're damn right I'm going to keep doing it. The propaganda is not going to slow down here on United People's TV. It is pure Eric prop. And there will be more of it. I suppose we'll know really whether this club is changed or not uh, by the time the summer ends. It is all about transfers. This, oh, Of course it's all about transfers. It's literally the, the, the summer transfer window, right? But we'll know by the end of this summer whether the club really is switching, really is changing. Because if, if it comes to the start of the season, I think it's the 6th of August. If it comes to that point and we're like, right, it's another summer where we've just, we've, we've fucked up, haven't we? We've taken ages to make this signing. We've not made the crucial signings that we needed to make in these, these positions. Then maybe I was, my optimism was misplaced. But we'll see, I suppose. But look, if we go back to the Telegraph's article, we're speaking about what's going on here. It said, in London, Ten Hag will mainly discuss the details of the selection. Manchester United is looking to make efforts and invest more than 140 million euros to give them the right start. The names of a number of Ajax players, Yuri and Timber or Anthony, or former Ajax players, Frankie de Jong, are on the table, but not everything will be feasible. Now, 140 million euros. What's, what's your immediate reaction to that? 140 million euros. Do you think that's enough for, for Ten Hag? Type yes or no in the comments. Um, because... 140 million, what's that? Like 125 million pounds, roughly, there or thereabouts. It seems a little bit under, in my opinion. Now, I'm going to do a separate video on this. I've already got it planned on why I think um, Eric Ten Hag needs and deserves a 200 million pounds budget. And that's not just a number I've just pulled out of thin air and there's no evidence or context or circumstances to prove that that's the case. But there really is. And I want to run through that and explain exactly that in the video that I will do. Um, Paula, you're saying no, not even with sales. Lots and lots of you are all saying that, no, that's probably not going to be enough. Uh, no. Eh, I'd say that's pretty much 100. I'm pretty much 100% are saying no. I personally don't think it's enough either. And that's not to say that I'm being greedy and I want United to go huge in the market. But I just think given that, given what United need to do, it doesn't strike me as that's going to be enough. But Eric Ten Hag is meeting this week. And again, that's a video that I'm going to be bringing out on Saturday. And it's part of it. It's part of the situation. It's this reality that we know that in a pipe dream situation, we're signing Chua Many in midfield. We're signing Frankie de Jong to go alongside him. We're going to sign Nkunku or Nunes up front. We're going to sign Timber as the centre-back right back. And it's brilliant. It's great. We win it all. All the pots. And then the reality sits in. It's like, yeah, well, United probably won't do that. United probably won't spend that much. That's why I'm going to do a video on Saturday. It's going to be like seven smart signings that Manchester United could do. Signings that will be all under 25, 30 million pounds. Maybe players that people aren't particularly talking about. Because I think that's what we've got to do in this summer transfer window. We're going to have to be, we're going to have to get 
a name like Timber or, or a name like Frankie Dion, but we're also going to have to really maybe bring in a couple of free transfers, maybe bring in a couple of smart transfers that are well scouted, that are in the 10 to 15 million range that after a season or two of progress would be worth 30 to 40 million. It's what United have got to do. United have got to do it. And that's why I'm doing that video that's going out on Saturday. So make sure if you're new here to United People's TV, drop a like on the video, subscribe. You don't want to miss that one out. Uh, and as I will say, look, the QR code is down there. Pop your phone up, take it to the screen, and that will take you through to the podcast. United People's podcast with four episodes in. Uh, the response has been brilliant so far. I spent months and months planning that podcast because I could have launched it ages ago. And I was like, no, I want the quality to be good. I bought everybody microphones who's going to be included in it. I taught them. I taught them. I helped them get all, And I hope it's good. And I, it seems like some of you are enjoying it. And I'm looking forward to getting that continued over the summer. It might start turning a bit more irreverent over the summer because we don't want to talk about transfers 24-7. But it's, a good, it's going to be a good chat. Uh, Stacey, random question. Do you play football manager? I was more LMA manager. It's probably showing my age there. Back in the day, LMA manager. I just didn't like the fact that you didn't have any sort of football, even if it was shit graphics. I liked LMA manager because it had that on it. So I probably spent more time on LMA manager than I have on Football Manager. That's what I think so anyway. Uh, but look, what I'm going to do now is head over to this article. It's a very interesting article that was released this morning by Andy Mitten. Andy Mitten, of course, the editor of United We Stand, long-standing Manchester United fanzine, alongside Red News, Barney at Red News. Big up to both of those guys for the for how important fanzines still remain. So if you... If, I should really promote them. I'll, I'll try and get the links from them, see if we can promote them on here, and you can try and help keep those fanzines alive. It's an important part of United's culture really is. But Andy has written a detailed article here on the National News. I don't know where that website is. The National News. Anyway, we're going to run through it. There's quite a lot of points he makes that I think we can discuss here in the comments. Let's run through it together. We won't run, run through all of it. It will take too long. But he says, um, go down here. Like Manchester United's trophyless season will end against Selhurst, Crystal Palace. I didn't know this. Look at that. Sunday is a big game against Crystal Palace side who still have the potential to jump from 13th to 9th. A difference of £18 million in prize money. That is a lot of dough. I didn't realize that the jump was that big. There's me going into this going into this game thinking, well, Crystal Palace are mid-table. They've had a decent season, but it's not really going to matter to them that much. 18 million. Wow. 18 million is quite a lot. Uh, Jonathan, I will probably completely disagree with that comment. He's a Twitter fiend, if you call it. <laughs> and he was there long, long, long before Twitter really came around and he will be there after as well. He's a man very, very well connected in the club and I do respect him. Uh, but let's run through what else he says inside this article. Da, da, da. Eric Ten Hag has been keen to start his new job early after leading Ajax to their third title. But the first time he'll work with his new team is scheduled to be at the end of June. So he's saying that he's not particular. Eric Ten Hag, I didn't think that Eric Ten Hag was going to work with the players next week. I still stand by the fact that I think Eric Ten Hag should be meeting the players next week. I do think Gary Neville's correct on that. It, he he has to make his own judgments and calls. He can't just rely on other people and what they say. And I think I think uh, Andy speaks about that down here. Um, da, 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 where is it? Is that a little bit further down? I probably should have waited. Ah, sorry. I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit later on. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Anyway, let's go down and see what else Andy has to say. So on the coaching side, Radnick and some of the coaches he brought in will depart. Neil Ryan is going to be leaving. Now, Neil Ryan, if you don't know who he is, sorry, Neil Ryan, Neil Wood, my bad. Has he written Neil Ryan there? Coach Neil Ryan. Oh, maybe I don't know. Maybe he's a completely different coach. But Neil Wood's going to be leaving. He is the under-23s coach, going to be going and joining Salford City. Um, Gary Neville sacking another manager. Goodbye, Lee Bowyer. But Neil Wood, he's going to be going and join. So there has been, honestly, man, it's kind of hard to keep your head around. I think I'm going to have to do another updated video as the summer goes on. I've already done a video on the updated club structure at Manchester United, sort of showing you how the structure's changed, who's gone where. Fingers crossed we still get Paul Mitchell in. Doesn't really, I don't really think that's going to be happening. Um, then... What's his face? Andy O'Boyle. I think he's going to be coming. There's still more to come. Uh, Jonathan saying, is that American coach leaving? What a difference he made. Of course, he will be leaving. Uh, and I, what I will say about Chris Armas, man, and I said it from the immediate time it happened. As soon as Lars Kornetka turned us down, he was the person who was working underneath 
Ralph Radnick at Lokomotiv Moscow, who now is going to become his assistant manager at Austria. As soon as he turned us down, I was like, oh, shit. Because you knew that at that point, as an interim manager, he couldn't go out and get who he wanted in. He's like, who can I get in? Uh, Chris Armas, in you come, man. You've got some sort of link. He would never have been top of his list. It was basically a, a, a sort of a beggy situation where Ralph Randy just needed staff. I don't think he expected Carrick to leave. I think that sort of swept him a little bit. Um, fair play to Carrick for doing that. Kieran McKenna. I mean, he's done okay at Ipswich, to be fair. Uh, Reba, what are you saying? So a couple of super chats. Signing Mar Timber or Martinez, Nunes and Neves would be great. Um, Timber, yes, or Martinez. We're going to be speaking about Martinez next. Nunes, I'm still a bit reserved on, but obviously would be a good signing. And Neves, you know what I think about Neves. Uh, the podcast, uh, Bebo, is available already on Spotify. You can see the little logos down there. Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon, I think. I think that was correct. It's available on all of those. I won't be putting it on YouTube at the moment. I feel quite strongly that, you know, I know that podcasts, Joe Rogan's podcast, for example, huge podcast, it's on YouTube too. But I like the fact that it's like a different, it's a different side of, I like to offer different types of content on different platforms. If I was to just put the same podcast on YouTube that I was to put on Spotify, then you wouldn't listen to both really, would you? Maybe I'll put it on Spotify in the future, but also I, th I think people enjoy the fact that it's just audio and not video. Not everybody loves being on video, man. Just me. Apparently. Oh, the Botman rumor is true. I think we should definitely be signing him. He's the second coming of Yap Stam. Was it Sven Botman? Was it Lil he was at? Where is he at now? Let's have a look. Sven Botman. Oh, look, he's still at Lil. Look at that. My football knowledge is sometimes better than I think it is. Um, de -de -de. Not nearly enough, says an echo. You want to have 250 mil. Uh, Tom saying, look, Gary Neville's a hypocrite, talks about. Other, other clubs sacking managers after one season, yet sacks Bowie after one season. Yeah, he's kind of making himself a, a little bit hypocritical when it comes to that situation. Isn't he? But, you know, I'm not going to get into that too much. Let's go back down here and let's see what... So, Jake, you're saying might be cool just to have YouTube clips and the full podcast on Spotify. Yeah, but if I do that, then I'm just going to start... The channel is going to start getting tons and tons of videos. It's going to be hard for you to keep up on that. If I was to do that, I would separate it out completely and just have a United People's Podcast channel. That's what I would do anyway. Um, but look, let's go down here and read a bit more from Andy Mitten because this is all insight into the club. Poor results have meant that negativity has seeped into the dressing room and there are divisions and suspicions. An investigation into leaks from the dressing room was carried out and concluded with the club satisfied that it will be less of an issue next season. Now, you can let me know what you think about that. I and mean, obviously, we've, we've all got our suspicions as to who the leaks have come from, where the leaks have come from, sorry. Probably Rebecca Vardy, for being completely honest. But United need to, to get control of that. Ten Hag's talked about the control. I've talked about it as like you've got to close the doors and put the bolt over it. That's what United need to be doing with our dressing room next season. Too much information going into the dressing room, too much information coming out of the dressing room. That has to change, and I hope it will. So the club there saying they've done an investigation into the leaks. Well, the proof's in the pudding. Let's see what happens from next season onwards, right? Um, I know Jesse Lingard is going to be somebody who a lot of people point the fingers towards, and that's because Paul Scholes inadvertently, not really inadvertently, just said it on national TV. Just said, yeah, Jesse's been talking to me. He's been telling me what's happening in the dressing room. So it's obvious that Jesse Lingard's been speaking out about it. Um, I don't know who else is doing it. Again, you can make your own assumptions, but United need to get on top of that. Uh, this I found, I don't know. This one's, a, I suppose, a debate that we could still have. Ralph Randick has failed as an interim manager. He, he has, in terms of the football, for sure. And the idea that he has overseen other decisions at the club in relation to staff or play departures is accurate. Inaccurate, sorry. He had almost no say in the appointment of Ten Hag. He was told to concentrate on coaching the first team. Whether his United consultancy becomes a meaningful one, as he hopes, is doubtful. Now, I'll be completely honest, man. I I don't personally feel from the way that it's uh, the way that it's developed, the way that it's happened, that Ten Hag, sorry, that Ralph Randick has had a massively direct, influential part to play in everything that's happened. But I just really feel there's indirectly his voice, his approach, and his presence has been 
something like a line that's been drawn in the sand. I think he's influenced the way that conversation has gone. Now, I can't prove or disprove that. It's just what my gut is telling me. And as I've said to you before, I would not change a single thing that's happened at this club since November because I wouldn't want it to change the position we're in now, which I now think is a very good position with Matt Judge gone, with John Murto making all the changes behind the scenes, with Eric Ten Hag confirmed, with Mitchell van der Gag coming in, with Ten Hag already working early. I wouldn't change a thing. And that's why I think the idea of dismissing Ragnick's even indirect involvement in it, I think is unfair. Bebo, you're saying, do you think Solskjaer will be the next Salford manager? No, I think it'll be Neil Wood. I think he's going there. But, oh my God. This, by the way, we need to, as a collective fan base, nip this in the bud. All right? Don't you dare let that chant <laughs> Don't you dare let that chant start. All right? Come on, people. You're better than that. You're absolutely better than that. <laughs> because that is a bad chant. Please, people, don't let that come anywhere near Old Trafford. Jeez. Uh, Dan, you're saying Ralph has been the best thing to happen to the, us this year. That voice is important. I think it's, the, as I said, I, th I think the voice is, is key, man. The voice is, I think it's indirect. I'll be completely honest, right? I, f I feel like there's a, that I don't particularly think that it's, it's Ralph Radnick leading these decision-making processes, but I think he's, he's got into, I don't know how to describe it. He's got into people's heads. I just feel like his presence has made a difference. Uh, and you're saying, Sam, I feel there was a clearly defined turning point in his press conference. His early ones were more po polite, politic, political, polite. His later ones were far more scathing. Absolutely. That definitely did happen. And I tell you what, Jonathan, you are going to get timed out. You have been warned. Don't be spamming the comments there about that chant. Jeez. Uh, anybody who spams the comments, you know what happens. You're going to get timed out. Simple as that. Um Da, da, da. Oh, look, Paula, support. Yeah. drop a like on the video, people. That'd be a very good idea. Let's run into it now. I know lots and lots of you want to talk about transfers, right? And this is what the reports are saying from the Telegraph here, that 140 million will be given to Eric Ten Hag. Now, this came out yesterday, which was a bit of a... Huh? Wasn't expecting that. Lissandro Martinez was linked to Manchester United. What's your take on that? Is this just like, I mean, Christ, who else are we going to get linked to? Tagliafico, he can come in at left back and do a job. Yeah, why not? Anthony, yeah. Sebastian Haller up front as a supporting role for Cristiano Ronaldo. Jeez, bring Tadic in too. Why not? Bring them all in. I'm not saying that Lissandro Martinez is a bad player. I'm far from it. He's come in and been part of that new look Ajax team and he's been key alongside Yuri and Timber as that centre-back partnership that replaced De Ligt and Blind because Blind then moved towards left back. <laughs> Lissandro Martinez is a good player. Just think it's just think it's a bit weird. Just a little bit, a little, little no, no, weird's the wrong word. Just a little bit odd. I don't know whether it's just lazy journalism. Ray, you're saying I think Ralph Rannick has not failed because if we kept Carrick, we bring in Poch. Oh man, yeah, that could have that could have easily happened. As I said, I would not change one single thing that we have done since November because I I like the position that we're in now. Even I, even though it's been painful, it has been painful and humiliating at points. But it's that exposure, the wounds are all out. And now we can start healing as a club, if you want to call it that. Um, there's a comment there from... Oh, where's it gone? Jack, you're saying, do you think that the truth on Frankie will come out next week with La Liga and the Premier League ending? Hey, look, man, let's find out. If we're looking at the latest reports on Frankie de Jong, it's this from Chris Wheeler from the Daily Mail. Saying Manchester United have told Barca they won't blow their budget on a £70 million deal for Frankie de Jong. And Barcelona want to recoup the £65 million it costs to sign him. And a compromise remains way off. I spoke about this yesterday, didn't I? Uh, I've said, look, there are, Barcelona are at a crossroads where they have to make money. They need to make money in order to make signings. That is, that's the only fact in this situation. Barca's finances are absolutely screwed. And they need money. Whether they can get that by selling off different parts of the club, that remains to be seen, and that will drag on a little bit. I don't think United will go in and give uh, give Barca what they paid Ajax for De Jong. I think we're kind of be foolish to do so, and that's what Graham Hunter said as well. Graham Hunter may have um, put some doubts over De Jong's progression. I think he's coming from more of a Catalan perspective. That's what I think. So anyway, uh, that's kind of the impression I got. But I don't think we'll be paying that much for him. I think a £50 million bid 
they wouldn't reject that out of hand. I think it's a, it's a conversation to be had. Jonathan, you're saying, what about Milinkovic Savic in midfield? He's surely gettable for getting De Jong. I think that Lazio put like an insane price on him, haven't they? Absolutely insane price of him. I, 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 uh, and you're saying my spidey senses are screaming that Barca are just playing games to convince, convince De Jong to take a pay cut. I don't think De Jong would be taking a pay cut. I don't know why you do that. Um, say the jungle, Ralph would have done much better if he was given the time to prepare for the job. Did not have to scramble to get the coaches. This is the club's fault in the end, not planning per usual. Look, I, I said, I remember that. Do you remember we had that two-week international break before the Watford game? I was like, bro, not bro, United, just get rid of Solskjaer now. You give our new manager two weeks to get on the phone to start. I mean, two weeks is a long time for an interim manager. Uh, interim managers don't really get that. And if you had United sacked him then, instead of waiting for our next game, where we lost 4-1 to sack him the day after, mm -hmm. then it would have had another two weeks for uh, for Ralph Radnick. Presumably, the conversations wouldn't have been any different with Lars Konecka, because he rejected it after. I don't know why that would have changed if he had two weeks to think about it. But maybe Ralph Radnick would have been able to get different coaches in. Maybe he would have had an opportunity to speak to Michael Carrick. Maybe he could have convinced him to stay until the end of the season. I don't know. All hypothetical situations. But I don't think he was helped by the situation that developed, for sure. Um, Jonathan, uh, you, I've done a whole video on this, so you can, I completely agree with you there. If De Jong doesn't want to come to United, I don't want him at Manchester United. And I would have that same logic applied to any player in the world, man. We, we can't have players at the club anymore whose first and foremost thought is, how much am I getting paid at the end of the week? Where's my money? Of course, they're going to get paid for their job. Absolutely. They, they deserve that wage. But it shouldn't be the reason that they join the club. They want. They should have to want to play for United. They have to want to be part of this Eric Ten Hag vision that he's got, because it will change their relationship with the club. It will change their approach to the games. If we're one nil down in the last twenty minutes, it will change their approach to that last twenty minutes and how much they really want to commit to that, to turning that result around, because they're bought into the vision of the club because they want to be successful at United. That's why it's imperative that that's a key part of any signings that we make. That's why I think so anyway. Now, lots of you have been mentioning this in the comments, so I will speak about it. This was a video that was released yesterday from Man United of the Religion. John, I've been in conversations with John, I think as probably as long as 18 months, two years. I messaged him saying, look, I really like what you're doing. Um, you share the same belief that I do about the Glazers. It'll be good to work together. So I've always been in conversation with John. And he's released this video yesterday, which was a half an hour interview with Michael Knighton. Maybe what I'll do is speak to John, see if he's OK with me using some of the footage. And maybe I can do a separate video on this interview. Now, I've already emailed. I actually spoke to Michael yesterday uh, on email. I was like, look, I know we spoke previously about having an interview based off the fact that you've done this now. It feels like it might be an appropriate time for us to have a chat. He's replied, I'm in conversation. I'll see what goes on there. But Michael Knighton, of course was going to be buying Manchester United back in the 80s and then became a director. He joined the board. And I said this all... Look, I said, this is what I said. I'll put, I'll put this full screen. I said, look, as we said in our video a couple of weeks ago, everything has its price. And if you think the Glazers would not consider a four to four and a half billion pounds bid for United just to hold on to a 20 million pounds per year dividend, then you're wrong. We've been in contact with Michael already and we need more of this. Good. We do need more of it. And there will be more of it on United People's TV. And if I can get an interview with Michael sorted, I will bring it to United People's TV and we'll keep pushing it. The 1958 started their uh, cyber, was it cyber boycott, I believe it was. Um, I think it was Adidas yesterday. And no doubt there'll be more of it. But that'll be a good thing, right? Um, Ray, I wouldn't... I wouldn't say it seems more likely now. I wouldn't say if it seems likely, it seemed likely uh, after the European Super League. But just the way things are going and that there's no way in this market that the Glazers are just going to turn down like a four, four and a half billion bid for the club. And they can talk about how much they want for it. But right now, it's according to valuation in Forbes, I think it's worth $4.2 billion. So $4.5 billion. Come on, Jim, do the thing. Do the thing. Ephraim, I can see you spamming here, but I apologize about not answering it. What is it about the transfers? We're going to the market like a tortoise. As we've gone before, at least we should have agreed with two, three players. I would say hold your horses there, Ephraim. It quite literally is the 19th of May. We quite literally haven't 
ended the season. What we're seeing now with Eric Ten Hag coming to the club, with Eric Ten Hag having transfer meetings, is United, and I haven't been able to say this for a long time, United are acting proactively. I know we've got that mindset in us right now of not impatience, but frustration at seeing how long the club take. Other clubs are still focusing on their seasons because they're, they're not shit and they have actually got something to play for. But we're actually taking advantage of having that extra breathing space by taking a step forward, right? Taking a step forward. And we're actually, instead of waiting until the season's over before we have these conversations, what we're doing now, we're being a bit proactive. So I wouldn't say it's a time to say, oh, I wish we had two or three deals in place right now. It's a good thing that United are actually just being proactive. And that's that that's a change. That's a change in itself. And Jack, that okay, that's fair enough. It's frustrating seeing City sign Haaland. I'm yeah, okay. Well, I'm being being a bit of an idiot there. That was a that was a release clause. City, I wouldn't say they had a free run in, but it was City or Real Madrid. That was quite a relatively straightforward-ish deal to I'd say straightforward deal. It was an expensive deal to get through, but it was a it was a deal that could be done very quickly. And clearly, there is the case. Sam, did you see the BBC video yesterday about United, what will happen to Old Trafford? Well worth a watch. I don't, I didn't, uh, if you can just slide into my DMs on Twitter, send me that and I will watch it. And as I always do at the end of every single stream, I'm not going to end just yet, but you fire in your questions, anything I haven't answered, you make sure you fire it in and I'll try and answer as many as I possibly can. Make sure you please drop a like on the video, people. Lots and lots of you are watching and joining in these days. I love to see the community growing. But drop a, drop a like on the video. Come on. Um, Anthony, you're saying, I think the Glazers were banking on the Super League money, making them more money. But since it fell, they can see anything happening. And that's one thing that you know, I praise. I, I do praise Andy Mitten and a lot of what he says. But this bit here, I remember this now. This confused me a little bit. While there is much scope for improvement in United, sorry, while there is much scope for improvement in several areas at United, new does not necessarily mean better. Heman Siao, for example, very highly regarded as the chief strategist, chose to go last week. Now, yes, he was the chief strategist and he was absolutely involved in the European Super League. He was absolutely, he was one of the architects of Project Big Picture. He was the chief strategist of situations where Manchester United's board tried to kill Manchester United. So you're damn right that I will celebrate him and Seattle going away, because I think the strategy of the club has been appalling for 10 years. And if he is the chief strategist, then yeah, I will celebrate him leaving. Even if there are other things that he does good behind the scenes. Thought that was a bit of an odd one there. I'll be honest. Um, Bebo saying, not going to lie, you look like Dean Henderson a bit. I'll take that. I've, I've had a lot worse than Dean Henderson, trust me. A lot worse than Dean Henderson. Um Time for us to box a bit more clever now. Start looking at players like Enzo Fernandez and Tyrell Malasia. Make sure you check out that video. It's going out on Saturday. As I say, seven smart signings. Uh, not necessarily players that you would have heard of or players that we've been linked with at all. There's a couple of players that we might have tentatively been linked with, but they're smart signings in the region of 10 to 20 million who could come in and really improve our squad. Maybe not the first team players that we need, but we need squad players as much as we need first team players, don't we? Especially with how many players are leaving. Uh, Ray is saying, look, I don't think he's making that bid just yet. I think he should be making that bid. I've already done a video encouraging him to do that bid. That's going to change sweet FA. He won't listen to him. Probably doesn't even watch YouTube. Why would you? You're a billionaire. You could probably own YouTube. I can own it. But I'd love him to do it. Michael Knight is speaking about it. There's momentum as such, if you want to call it that. Uh, Jonathan, Glazers and FSG will be back for Super League. Um if the door isn't completely closed. I mean, the, the, the new Champions League format's a bit Super league isn't it? It's a bit weird. Sean, he's saying, getting worried about the links of uh, Bayern and Ajax players. I still believe Bayern and Champions League football may have a bigger pull. It, it could well do. Obviously, they've got Masrawi, they've got Gravin Birch. They're linked with Timber now as well. We have to see that. And that's why we've got to go quickly. And that's why us having the early step and the, uh, the early doors movement with Ten Hag will help us in that situation. Anthony, first time you're joining in live. Yes, my friend. Lovely to have you on board here. Um, da, da, da. actually you're saying Sam I know it's only early but who do you think the first play will be in will be and when mm. watch my video that I'm going to be releasing at lunchtime for that answer look at that That's, uh, and there's a comment that's saying Ame so please don't do so long videos a max five minute video no 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 five minutes is not long enough for a video uh, I do do short videos they go out every single day roughly 10 to 15 minutes 
I won't ever be doing five minute videos. That's not enough time to articulate the points that I discuss. And I do my, I'm very happy and proud of the content split that we've got. We've got the live interactives in the morning, 9.30 every day. And it's great. The community is getting built there. And also we've got the shorter ones that go out every lunchtime. And I won't be changing that. Uh, over the summer, I, I will be doing more lives because there'll be more transfer stories to react to as the days progress. But I'm going to keep it exactly as it is at the moment. Uh, Clement, you're a newbie. Love your show. Thank you very much for joining in. Hey, look, um, I enjoy I, I enjoy this chat every single morning. We've gone into a bit of detail there discussing all the stories about this. Eric Ten Hag is going to be in England. He's hopefully going to be going to the game against Crystal Palace. And hopefully I can get a picture with him. Come on, Eric. Come on, Eric. But um, thank you all for joining in this morning. Make sure, uh, look, Anthony has a good one. Twitter wasn't for sale until Elon Musk showed all those zeros. But then uh, Elon Musk has also said, hmm, prove to me that there's only there's 5% or less bots on Twitter. And Twitter CEO can't bring proof at the moment. So he might not be buying Twitter after all. It is what it is. Um, but look, thank you very much for joining in. As always, every single morning, I'll be here tomorrow morning. And trust me, you want to be joining tomorrow morning's stream. It's, I'm going to be announcing the 250,000 subscriber giveaway. And it's a good one. I'm going to be announcing the new community. And it's Friday. So happy days. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, look, I'll be here later with my um, shorter video, which will be longer than five minutes. That'll be going out at lunchtime. I'm going to run through my predictions for, for this summer and what I think United will do with the squad. Um, We're going to do it anyway. I didn't even introduce that one. I didn't even introduce that. Barry just like came on himself. But look, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. I'll speak to you soon. Take it easy.